Hello, I'm going to start on ideal guess. Now, if you look up um, Google and look up Wiki on <clears throat> the kinetic theory of ideal guess, you find um, a classical um, explanation <clears throat> which goes something like this. You have a box and you have a an atom of an ideal gas, we assume that different atoms do not interact with each other. And we start by saying you have this atom that goes bouncing around back and forth between the two walls, and then it will go on to use Newton's second law to calculate the pressure and eventually obtain an expression for the average energy of an of a particle in the ideal gas. So using Newton's second law together with the ideal gas law. Alright, this classical picture of the kinetic theory will give us an average energy for each particle which is equal to 3 over 2 K B T. So this is just a quick review of what we already know and what we want to now explain and understand using statistical mechanics. Now as uh, before, we are going to eventually use statistical mechanics to calculate the, the heat capacity of this ideal gas. So based on this formula obtained from the kinetic theory, we can write down an expression for the ideal gas if we first write down the, the total energy. Now the total energy of the particles, if there are n particles in this gas, then I would get the total energy by multiplying the average energy by n. then I can get the ideal, uh, I can get the heat capacity if I differentiate the total energy by temperature. That gives 3 over 2 and K B. So this is an expression that we will try and derive um, and to put it in a form that might be more familiar. If there are if the number of particles here is one mole, n would be the Avogadro constants. So that would be n a and n a and n a times k b the Boltzmann constant. It's the gas constant 3 over 2 r. So that might be a more familiar expression. And this is the heat capacity. So using this as a... And, and it is known that this agrees well with experiments for, for gases that are close to ideal, like um, noble gases like helium and so on. So using this as a, as a guide, as a, as a goal, we're now going to try to derive this again using the microscopic theory using energy states and what we know of quantum mechanics. So our goal is to find the heat capacity of the ideal gas and in order to find this we need to know the total energy and in terms of the the energy levels. The total energy is equal to number of particles in each in each level times energy of that level plus the same for the next level dot dot dot. So that's what we are after. And in order to find this total energy we must first find 
the energy levels and the number of particles in each level. So let's start by the energy level. Now the energy level of an ideal gas is obtained by solving the Schrodinger's equation for a particle in a box. So consider a cubic box with a side of length A. And let me call this side of the box the x direction, call that the y direction, and the axis coming out of the board, the z direction. Now if we have a box like this with zero potential in between uh, inside and infinite potential in the wall so that the particle cannot cannot get out of the wall. When you solve the Schrodinger's equation, then along each direction, the solution is essentially a sine wave. And we have the sine waves in the three directions multiplied together. All right. So for example, in the x direction, the wave function would be kx of x. And likewise, we have a wave function in the y, we have a, a, a component in the, a factor in the y direction and one in the z direction. So there will be these three functions for each direction multiplied together. And in each direction, because the walls are infinite, has infinitely large potential, so this must be zero at the two walls, at zero and at a. So that's length of the wall and when we, we put this into the x we will find that kx must satisfy a certain condition which is that kx times a has to be a multiple of pi I call that an x and this is called the quantization condition that means that because the sign of the sign of um, kx times a, the, because the wave function must be zero at the wall, this is only possible if the argument is a multiple times pi. So kx must satisfy this condition. It is a multiple whole number times pi over a, and likewise for ky. Kz. So we have this quantization condition. It tells us what are the um, wave vectors kx for which a wave function is possible, meaning an, a, a state of the particle is possible. So, and from Schrodinger's equation, we also know that the wave vector kx, ky, kz are related to the energy of the particle by this expression um, h bar squared over 2m where m is the particle multiplied by bracket kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared is equal to the energy Of the particle. And these are the results that we are going to use um, without actually going through the Schrodinger's equation uh, again in this in this lecture. So, in, in order to obtain the energies and know what the states are, we need this quantization condition and we need this expression that relates the wave vector to the energy. So in principle, now that um, we have a way to calculate the energy, because we, we know we would know the mass of each atom, and if you have a particular box, you would know the length of the box A, and you know that Nx can be uh, must be integer, so it must go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So this means that we have, in principle, 
we know all the energy levels. So it seems that we can then go on to find what the population of the particles are at each level. But before that, there is something that we need to do. Now the thing is this, the, in, in the case of an ideal gas, we have a situation where there is an infinite number of energy states because the integer n can go from 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on. So it, it can carry on forever. Now this means that calculating u would be more complicated because there is an infinite number of terms. Now in order to make this, um, in order to help us to do this calculation, there is one thing that we need to do first for the ideal gas. Now, what happens in the ideal gas is that if I imagine drawing a graph, the horizontal axis, the energy of each state, and the vertical axis, the number of particles in each state. Now this quantization condition means that not all energies are possible, only certain discrete energies are allowed. And what happens here is this, the number, there will be a certain number of particles in each energy state. So if I imagine plotting a graph, for each energy, there will be a certain number of particles and so on. And if I plot the graph, it might look something like this. Right? So that's one way the graph could look like. Or the other possibility is that we might have all the particles, for example, concentrated only on, say, the, the lowest few states here. So just a few states down here. So we, we might imagine these two extreme situations. Now, if the particles are actually distributed over many energy states, it would actually be easier if we can somehow approximate the, the energy states and the number of particles as a continuous function of energy. Whereas if it is only concentrated in the lower few states, it would be easier if we just find the particles in those states and then, and then add them up over there. So in order to decide, in order to find out which is the situation, uh, because uh, we need we, we need to know this in order to help us to to do the calculation properly. Let's see if we can estimate, all right, where this the average energy of the particle of the particles is, and if we can estimate the interval, all right, the, the spacing between the energy states. So this will give us an idea of where, whether the, the particles are distributed over many energy levels or whether it is just concentrated over, over a few. And then we can decide what to do next. Now in order to compare this with this, we already have the equations, the formulas that we need. Now let's start with the average energy. We already know the average energy from the kinetic theory. The average energy for each particle is 3 over 2 kV p. Right, that's the kinetic energy. Now if you 
if you think about the formula that we have just seen about relating the energy to the wave vectors and the quantization for the wave vectors, we also have an idea of the spacing between the energy levels. We can, as a first estimation, take the NX here to be just 1. All right? And then you can put in, say, a typical value for A, a box A, which might be, say, 10 centimeters, something that we can hold in our hands. Now, if you put this number in here, and perhaps if we consider a helium atom, a helium atom will have a relative mass of 4. So this would allow us to calculate M. So if I take this as a simplest case, I would take the Kx to be 1 and the Ky to be 0 and Kz to be 0. I can then calculate an energy. And this energy will give us an idea of the spacing in between uh, energy levels, at least around here. So by doing this, and by taking, say, the temperature to be around room temperature, say 500 Kelvin, we will be able to calculate a value for the average energy and a value for an estimate for the spacing between the energy levels. And if you do that, you will find that the, the, the average um, energy of the particle is indeed a lot larger than the spacing between um, energy levels. So once we, are, we have understood that this is the case, it then becomes clear that it is actually easier if we can somehow find a function that, um, that gives us a formula for, for this curve, for this distribution of the particles over the different um, en energies. So this is what we would need for the calculation, eventual calculation of the total energy. Now, the idea is this. In order to calculate this with by, by making use of a curve, what we would do is we would consider a small interval of energy, say d epsilon. Alright? And we would need a way to find the number of states within that interval. And then we and we would also need a way to find the number of particles in each state. So we'll start with finding the number of states within that interval. So that's what we'll do next. Let's start with this um, formula, h bar squared over 2m, kx plus ky squared plus kz squared is equal to the energy. This expression here is often ex written as k squared. So we, if we let this be k squared, we can then make use of what we know about the equation of a sphere to get an idea of how these states are distributed um, in a three-dimensional space. Now, but this is not a real three-dimensional space. If you, if you think about, let's say, uh, x, y, z, 
If you think about real space, and you think about a sphere around the origin of radius r, then the formula for this sphere is given by r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Now in this case, if you compare this expression, if you compare k squared equals to kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared with this, you see that if I imagine that the kx corresponds to x, ky to y, kz to z, and the k to the r, then I can pretend that I have this imaginary space in which the axes are kx, ky, kz, and that I have a sphere again centered around the origin with a radius k. So there's this correspondence between the equations and because of this connection, we can imagine a corresponding space which I shall call the k space. So in this k space, I can imagine a sphere. Now because of quantization condition, because all the kx, ky, kz must be an integer times pi over a, it means that the, the allowed values of say kx will only be in these regular steps. Likewise for the kz and the ky. Alright? So for example, um, each set of allowed values of kx, ky, kz would correspond to a certain point in k space. And not, so not all points are possible. The next possible point might be one step away at a distance of pi over a. So you have lots of these points distributed about k space. And the spacing between these points, the nearest spacing is always pi over a. So what we want to do is to find the um, find the number of states within a small energy which are called d epsilon small interval of energy now we know from here that the energy energy is connected to k by this function here so since we are working uh, in the variable k at the moment instead of finding for an energy of d e an energy of interval let me for the time being make use of an energy of k all right let, let's find the number of states for in this energy in in this interval dk and then later convert it to the energy the energy interval now an energy interval of dk if you look at this picture again you see a sphere of radius k an energy of interval of dk means that you increase this k by dk all right so that's the interval that is dk and i can imagine that this means the same as increasing the size of the sphere a little bit now what you see here is i have two spheres one slightly bigger than the other and in between is like a shell so if I look at this shell this shell will contain lots of these points in k space which represent the allowed values of kx, ky and kz so if I think of each of these points as a state then all I really need to do is to count the number of points within this shell and I would be able to get the number of states right how do we do that now we can do that by thinking making use of volume now if you can find the volume of this shell and if you know the volume associated with each each allowed point then you can just divide the two so two things that we need to do 
the volume of the shell. Now the volume of this shell, if you think of the surface area of the shell, the surface area is 4 pi k squared, just as the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So that's the surface area, you have this area, area around the sphere. Now if you have then if you imagine increasing the radius a little bit, you have this shell here. And the shell has, it, it, it would just be a very thin shell with a thickness of um, dk. Alright? So if you imagine a thin sheet of paper with an area A and a thickness d, then you can find the volume by multiplying the area by the thickness of, of that thin sheet. Now in this case, imagine that thin sheet being wrapped around the sphere. So to find the volume of, that, of this thin shell, all you need therefore is to take the area of the shell and multiply it by the thickness of the shell. And, and you will get an expression for the volume of the shell. So the area of the sphere, uh, of the the surface area of the sphere times the thickness of the shell. So the next thing we need to do is to find a volume associated with each point. Now, the idea is this. Imagine that we divide this volume, all right, we cut up this volume into little cubes of the same size. And each of these cubes must be centered around one of the points of the state. So if we do that, then each of this little cube would have a length of pi over a. Therefore, the volume of each of these cubes would be pi over a cubed. So if I imagine taking a little cube centered around each point, the volume of each cube is pi over a cubed. So now I have the volume of the shell and I have the volume of as for each for the cube around each point. So in order to find the number of points in the shell, all I need is to divide the shell volume by the cube volume. And then I would have the number of states. Now, but just one little thing that um, we need to consider. If you recall, I mentioned that the wave function um, used to obtain this can take the form of sine kx in the x direction, likewise for the other directions. Now, if you look at this wave function, then you see that kx can have positive or negative signs, depending on which side the axis it is. Now, if kx is negative, then I have sine kx x changing sign. All right? If I have a negative number in the sine function, the answer is also negative. But if you're talking about wave function, having a negative sign outside is in this case the same as uh, having a, a different multiplying factor. But it is really still the same wave function. So because of this, we, consider, we, we take it as the same wave function whether or not the kx is positive or negative. All right? And so we only need to consider the values of kx that is positive. All right? Because values of kx that are negative essentially gives you the same wave function. All right? Same as in up to a, a, a multiplying factor. The multiplying factor could be different, but the wave function itself is otherwise the same. So, Therefore, we only need to consider the positive signs, or you can choose the negative signs, but we'll consider the 
just the one sign, the one positive sign of Kx and Ky and Kz. And this means that we only need to consider one-eighth of the volume of, of, of this space, just the volume where all the Ks are positive. So, so the answer that I got from taking the shell volume dividing by the cube volume, I need to multiply that by one-eighth. And that would give me the number of states in the interval dk. So let me write this down. Right, I have a number of states in the interval dk is equal to the shell volume, which is 4 pi k squared dk, divided by volume around each point, which is pi over a cubed multiplied by 1 over 8. Right. Now, um, so this gives us an expression. Let me simplify this. I'll have um, dk over pi divided by pi cubed is a pi squared here, 4 divided by 8 is a 2 there, a cubed there, and a k squared there. So this is what it looks like. Now, it is common to think of a cubed as the volume, so I would write this as v for volume, so v is a cubed times k squared over 2 pi squared dk. So that's where we are, we have an expression for the number of states in the interval dk. Now to make things um, convenient for calculations, if you look at this expression here, right, we can think of a function and a name for this. So let me rearrange the dk. If I move it over to the other side, what I get is number of states divide by dk equals to v k squared over 2 pi squared. So we have number of states divided by the interval. Now this function is often denoted by g, by a function g of k, and is called the density of states. or in short, D O S. So it's a density in the sense that um, if you think about, say, the density of a solid object, you think about kilograms per, or, or grams per, per centimeter cubed. So that means that density of, of, of a solid object is the amount of mass per unit volume. And in this case, when we talk about density of states, um, GK, that would be the number of states per unit wave vector. So it's the same idea, but we have a wave vector instead of a volume in CM cubed. Right. Now we mustn't forget that um, 
we started off with trying to find the number of states in a certain energy level. So what we have now is the number of states in terms of the wave vector. So in order to that we can eventually do the calculation more easily, we should really convert this to um, the variable of energy. Let's see how to do that. Now, the first thing to, to note is that we know the relation between K and the energy. And that is um, energy is equal to K squared over H, H bar squared K squared over 2M. So this is the formula from Schrodinger's equation. Now you, you have a K squared there and a K squared here. So it's tempting to just rearrange this K squared to get it in terms of the energy and substitute the expression in that. But that does not give the correct density of states in the energy variable. Now let's think about why that's wrong. Um, let me um, let me keep this formula here. G k is equal to v k squared over two pi. Now recall that GK is the number of states over an interval in K. And so if I'm going to think of G as a function of energy, it would be the number of states over an interval of energy. So what's wrong with just substituting the energy variable in terms of K? Now let's look, take, take a look at that formula. Take a look at that formula. So that's <coughs> k squared and e. So parabola, just k and e. Right, it's a par parabola like that. So what we know is that. Um, if I have a certain interval dk that corresponds to a certain interval of energy given by that the e now clearly because this is a curve, dE will not be equal to dK. And in fact, as K increases, you can see that the energy interval for, for the same K interval, the energy interval would increase because the slope keeps going up. So because the K, the, a particular interval of K is not equal to the energy of E. So the dk here and the dk there are different. All right. So for the same number of states, 
we have different answers. Alright, because we are different, we divide them by different intervals. So that's why it doesn't work if we simply substitute, if we simply rearrange uh, k in terms of e and substitute it into that function or into this function in the hope of getting ge. We have to do something, we have to do this more carefully. And the way to do it is this. Now, as I've said, the dk here and the de there are different because of this formula. But since we are looking at the same number of states here, what we could do is to rearrange this so that the number of states would be gk times dk according to this expression and according to that expression the number of states will be de ge times de and since the number of states are equal these two expressions would be equal and that should be our starting point when we try to find the density of states in terms of energy so at this point I should mention that to be very precise the g here, the function g here is really a different, fun different function from the g there. So, in fact, we should really write, use different symbols for the g here and the g there. But by convention, we keep the same, ex we keep the same symbol g and g, and that could be a source of, of confusion. But if you remember that this function g, this function for density of states, is really a distribution function. It tells us how the states are distributed at different energy intervals. And this is the convention for writing distribution functions. You will remember that as long as you see a different variable in a distribution function, it is a different function. So in order to calculate um, dg, uh, g as a function of energy we would then rearrange this to get um, gk times dk over de so now we see the difference instead of just gk being equal to ge gk must be multiplied by dk over de essentially the ratio of the two intervals, which makes sense. So once we have this, we can proceed. Now the gk there is just v k squared over 2 pi. To find dk by d epsilon, we could start by, we could start with that. So if I'm doing it in terms of um, in terms of k, this would be de by dk. If I differentiate the e, it would be h bar squared times k over m. Alright, so dk by de is just the inverse of that, which is m over h bar squared k and this simplifies to k squared and k cancels so v k m over 2 pi h bar squared so this is what it looks like but because we have we want to express it really in terms of the energy E Right, we don't want to keep the k there. We now want to express k in terms of the energy. Now if you do that, you find that k is equal to 2m epsilon. Bring the 2m up there. Um, 
square root over h bar. So we would replace the k there by that. And it would now look like v m over 2 pi h bar squared times k. Now, if you simplify this using the fact that h bar is really h over 2 pi, this would um, so look like this. So this would be the expression, final expression for density of states in energy variable. Right. And the thing to note is that the other, the other um, terms involved are m, the mass, v, the volume, and the Planck's constant, which are all constants with respect to energy. So the variation of this density of energy density of states with energy is in the form of the square root of energy. So if you imagine plotting a graph for that, the graph of GE looks like that. So that's GE, that's this, and this is the energy variable. Right, so, so far, I've obtained the expression for the density of states. Now, the next thing that we need to do is to obtain an expression for the number of particles in each state. So just to give an idea of what, where we are heading, If you recall, we really want to find the total energy and we have a situation where if I imagine plotting a graph of the number of particles at different energy levels I might imagine getting a curve that looks like this because the energy spacings are so small compared to the average energy of the of all the particles in the gas. So because of this, the idea was to make use of the idea of um, density of states in which we can calculate the number of states for for each interval of the energy. So using the idea of the energy of states, we know that if I take the energy of states and multiply by the interval, I would get the number of states in that interval. So this gives me the number of states in the E. So how do I get from here to the total energy? Right. Now in each of these states, there is a certain number of particles. Now let me call that F epsilon. Call it the number of particles in 
one state. Right? So if I multiply the number of states by the number of particles in one state, I would get the number of particles in the energy interval. And finally, if I multiply this number of particles by the energy, so it, this is a small interval of energy, say compared to the average energy of all the particles. So within this small interval, um, we can we can assume that the energy of the particles are roughly the same. Okay, so I'll take that. We can take that energy there as roughly epsilon at the center of the interval and just multiply E by the number of particles in that interval. So this is the number, of, this, is, this would be the total energy in the interval DE. So now that we have the total energy in the interval DE, we can then find the total energy of all particles by summing up the whole lot, by integrating from 0 to infinity. And this gives us the total energy of all particles. Right, so this is where we are at now, and this also tells us what we must do next. We must find the number of particles in one state. So we'll do that next.